Man, I am so pumped for this one. Coming up, an interview with a true 80s icon on one of the biggest songs of the decade. Uh, he was in the midst of a huge album. They have four big hits when he got invited to sit down with the biggest director in film history. This director wanted him to write a song for a new movie that was coming out because, as he explained it, uh, the hero from the film, he'd be a fan of his band. While the singer had never written for film, he was hesitant, told the director he didn't want to write a song with the same name as the movie. The director said, fine, just send me the next thing you write. He did just that, and it became a number one smash. The only problem is, as we'll find out in the interview, the filmmakers didn't capitalize on it, and they missed a window to have a big soundtrack album. Coming up next, the story of how this singer gave up 10% of the song's royalties to an old friend for coming up with the title of the song. The only problem here is the title was the same as two other songs that were on the radio, and it was a fairly common title. Also, he had a cameo in the movie, tells all that story. See if you remember it, coming up next. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest stars and the greatest songs of all time, especially today. You know, if you remember spending entire afternoons at the ancient dwellings known as the mall, you'll dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia, a time machine, I'm telling you. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button, click the bell so you always get our latest interviews and stories. You're gonna love what we have coming down the pipeline, especially today. I'm so excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations. This is where featured artists take us for a magical deep dive, exploring the greatest songs and albums in their repertoire, stories and points of view that you just won't find anywhere else. Today's a special one. This was uh, my favorite song when I was 10 years old. It came out in the glorious summer of 1985. It was the main song from not only the greatest blockbuster of 85, but maybe the best film of the 80s, and we've got the master behind it with us today. I'm talking about The Power of Love by Huey Lewis and the News. That's the power of love. From the magical time travel classic Back to the Future, it's truly become the, the Wizard of Oz of our time, as Huey said to me one time. Uh, it's a movie that our kids, kids watch. Not quite in that category yet, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's got to be a good movie. They even got jackets. Gonzo, show me jackets. So apparently, Huey Lewis was called into a meeting with the biggest filmmaker in the world, Steven Spielberg, who was producing the film, along with director Bob Zemeckis and his partner, Bob Gell. They both wrote the screenplay, as you know. Uh, they told Huey that they wanted him to write a song for this movie, Back to the Future, because the film's hero, Marty McFly, played by Michael J. Fox. History is going to change. And 1985 is not his year. Of course, Eric Stoltz was the first long story there. But they said that, that Marty McFly would be a fan of Huey Lewis and the News. And sports was huge at that moment. It was at number one for one week, like I said, in the ultra competitive year of 84, where uh, the least amount of albums went to number one ever. There'd never been that few albums uh, at the top spot. It was the year of three of the biggest blockbusters ever. You know, you have Michael Jackson, Thriller, Still Riding High. Prince Purple Rain reigned for 24 weeks at number one. And Bruce Springsteen's mega seller, Born in the USA, was there. Not to mention the Footloose soundtrack. So Huey stole number one for a solitary week off the strength of the singles, Heart and Soul. The Heart of Rock and Roll. This is it. This is it. Ooh, oh, let me know. And I want a new drug. I want a new drug. Well, I won't spill. Not to mention a couple of other cuts from the album that got an enormous radio play, including Bad is Bad. Then Walking on a Thin Line. That also charted. Uh, the album would go on to sell 7 million copies in the U.S. and over 10 million worldwide. No doubt about it, Huey Lewis, he was so hot that the number one movie of 1984 allegedly asked him to write their theme song, 
Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, starring Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd. He turned them down, but it's you know been well documented that they wanted his exact sound for their film. And in a lot of ways, they got it. Anyway, talk amongst yourselves below. Huey and the News, they were as hot as anyone in the mid-80s. Hot rock and roll, well, at the sit-down meeting with Spielberg and Zemeckis and Gale, Huey was hesitant to write a movie song because he'd never written for film before. Um, you know, up next, Huey is going to explain how that got resolved. Also, something that is not covered in this interview, but I think is an important and interesting part of the song story. Huey Lewis got the title of the song from an old bandmate, an old friend. Uh, when Huey was coming up in the 70s, he was, of course, in a band uh, called Clover. Sometimes, sometimes bad means bad, 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 bad. Uh, He was in it with a guy named Alex Call. Alex was a songwriter. He actually wrote the most famous phone number song ever, the 80s classic Jenny 8675309, uh, with Jim Keller for the one-hit wonder band Tommy Tuto. He also wrote Little Too Late for Pat Benatar, amongst others. I guess Huey called him up around this time and he just asked him, hey, what are you writing? What are you doing? So he told Huey he was working on this big power ballad called Power of Love. Huey really dug the title. And so a few months later, he cut Alex Call in on the deal for this title. Huey gave him 10% of the publishing for that title, The Power of Love, as, as a really nice gesture, I must say. Just the kind of guy that Huey is. I mean, never mind the fact that there were already two other big hits that were on the radio with that title at the very same time. The Power of Love by Jennifer Rush. The power of, love. Which of course, would later be a hit uh, for Laura Branigan. Even though there may be time. And then Celine Dion. And also The Power of Love by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. The power of love. Which actually wasn't a hit in the U.S. because it wasn't released here, but it did hit number one in the U.K. in late 84. Interesting thing is, all these songs called Power of Love were on the radio, like I said, at the same time. The only other song I can think of off the top of my head with so many different uh, songs with the same title are Lady. You know, Sticks, Kenny Rogers, The Commodores. Which actually, Jennifer Rush's song is sometimes referred to as Lady as well, because it says, I'm your lady. I am your lady. And actually, come to think of it, Jennifer Rush's song was not a big hit here either. Anyway, when The Power of Love went to number one, it became Huey's first chart topper, and would be the first of three number one hits almost in a row. They were Stuck With You and Jacob's Ladder, which would both follow. I am happy to be stuck with you. Yes, it's true. Step by step, run by run. It also hit number one on the U.S. mainstream rock chart, his second number one there. In the U.K., it was released as a double A side, along with uh, their U.S. top ten hit, Do You Believe in Love? It would actually be the band's only top 10 showing on the UK singles chart. It was a hit worldwide. It went to the top 10 just about everywhere, including number one in Canada and Japan. Now, strangely enough, Huey Lewis didn't put the song on his new album, Four, which just came out shortly after, because he wasn't allowed to. Now, it was put on international copies of Four, but not in America, which probably cost the, the band a couple million sales. But Huey will explain the huge mistake the label made with not putting the song out correctly and taking advantage of the movie's record-breaking moment and, of course, Huey's popularity at the time. Huey also got that masterful cameo role. Uh, do you remember it? He's going to tell us where the inspiration for that character came from. Like I said, this song, it's always been a favorite of mine. Uh, actually, a few months ago, I was honored to do a Professor of Rock Live event with Huey, and he told me all these great stories. 
Uh, this interview is a different one than that one, but uh, the live event that I did with him was really cool because uh, my mom was there. And I was able to share a personal story about this song that had to do with her, my mom. Uh, I remember when this song came out, I was in uh, a wedding line at my uncle's marriage reception. Later, they had this band playing the reception and everybody was dancing. Uh, this band, they were just playing 50s and 60s covers. I was halfway engaged, but being a little 10-year-old kid, I could, you couldn't pay me to dance. My mom was trying to get me on the dance floor. She was trying to get me to ask some neighbor girls to dance to no avail. There was no way I was going to do that. I, I sucked at dancing, still do. Well, so she made me a bet. She knew that The Power of Love was my favorite song, so she said that if the band played that song, that I had to go out and dance with her. I said, Mom, this band, they play oldies music. There's no way they know The Power of Love. Well, I went up and I requested it, and you know what? The band knew it, solid, and uh, they played it. I was shocked that the band knew this song because all night they were playing, you know, covers of Earth Angel and Runaway Sue. I thought there was no way they would know anything from our time. Well, a bet's a bet, and I had lost that bet, so I was forced to dance with my mom, and then later, this neighborhood girl. A bet's a bet. So, actually, I remember my dad snapped a picture of me dancing at that moment. You know, the band was playing Power of Love. And I told this story to Huey, and I had the picture on the screen behind us, and I uh, had my mom stand up. I embarrassed her on the spot, kind of returned the favor there. And, you know, it was really cool, because Huey, he laughed, and he said, well, it is called The Power of Love. So let's get into the interview. As we go into it, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Over 50 million pairs sold and a 30-day peace of mind return. Plus, you get to design your own pair, the color, the shape, the style. Zenny, I'm telling you, the only way to go. Add to that the fact that you can get a complete pair of prescription eyewear glasses for up to 80% off regular retail prices. It's a no-brainer. Click on the info button up here to get our special price. Here's Huey. Power of Love, Back to the Future, sports was popular. Robert Zemeckis, he kind of visualized that this is Marty's favorite band, Huey Lewis and the News. So he, he comes to you and tell me the story about how yeah, that they, all came well, together. They, had, they asked to have a meeting with us. That's Spielberg who produced it, Zemeckis who directed, and Bob Gale who wrote it. The way they framed it is they said, look, we've just written this film and our, and our lead character, Marty McFly, his favorite band would be Huey Lewis and the News. So we thought, why not ask you to write a song? I said, fine, love to, don't know how to write for film necessarily. And frankly, don't much care for writing a song called Back, Back to, to the, the Future. Future. And they went, no problem. We don't care what it's called. We just want one of your songs. And, and that turned out to be super smart because the next thing we, I said, well, I'll just send you the next thing we write, which was Power Love. And so they used it in a chase scene and they loved it. song came out and we were you know we had just come off our sports album so we were and it was the next thing released after yeah. sports and it went to number one immediately but immediately it's 12 weeks or nine to 12 weeks because it starts boma. starts out so they yeah. didn't release the movie till the song was number one and so zemeckis to this day credits it with the best marketing release yeah ever because the film came out and this was before there were a lot of songs with films and it's not when the film came out the song was already number one, so everybody went to see the film based on that. But now when the film got so huge, boy, did it help us everywhere else in the world, Asia. And well, yeah. You and Chris, I had read that you had the song pretty much finished, and then Johnny comes in with the da, 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 No, da. no, no, that's not Johnny's okay. contribution. Johnny's contribution was the bridge a little bit. We used to go to the bridge twice, and Johnny rearranged it a little bit. Johnny's got a great, he's a great arranger. He's got a great ear for... And you know, that, that's one of the secrets to our band is that we all contribute. One guy writes something mm -hmm. and then it, and all by himself, another guy comes in and reads it for the first time. He can immediately punch it up in two or three things. And that's what Johnny did the power of. It was Chris's music, pure and simple, the bridge and yeah. all that stuff. But. The other thing is in, in, this, in the movie when, 
when it comes in again, because it actually comes in again mm -hmm. when he gets the flyer. Bye. That's the power of love. That shows the power of that song. You just hear yeah. that one vocal. It's such a, a catchy yeah. song, but Back in Time to me was just as good of a song. In fact, I, I liked it a little bit better. Cause, cool. But did you get the script? Because that's basically yeah. a summary of the movie. They had, written the, they had written the film by then. We'd seen the film and, and all that stuff, and they wanted something for the credits. So because it was the credits outro, I decided I'd just write this for the film. Me, I'll be back in time. And that's how the album, the soundtrack album, went gold, because of that song. Because the soundtrack album came out later, too. Well, what's interesting is now that was before soundtracks, really, for the most part. And so that soundtrack album had Power Love, probably had Back in Time. It had Back in Time, And, yeah. and was there a Phil Collins song, maybe? There was or? an Eric Clapton song. Eric Clapton there song. was a Lindsey Buckingham song on there. And then Source and Music. And then Alan Silvestri's, and yeah. And then Source Music, Alan yeah. Silvestri's music. So it wasn't a great package. Well, Dirty Dancing which was a soundtrack album. A couple years later. A couple years later, it sold 13 million copies. I know. So that's what a mistake that was. I know. I mean, that, that thing could have been, and we, we never really sold, we weren't allowed to put Power Love on our record, except in the rest of the world. And yeah. So we never, you know, of all of our songs, we probably made less money on Power Love. So, than, so than crazy. Anything. Actually, Power Love, um, on the surface, had nothing to do with the movie. The lyric has nothing to do with the movie. Yeah. And there's no real love object in the movie, even. The way these things work best is when the song stands on its own, and then the movie stands on its own. If the song is clearly written for the movie, it kind of diminishes the song somehow. I use that as an example today because we have a new song used in this in an animated film, Animal Crackers. Just... And that's a classic example of that. And, and the song won't it's an afterthought in a and way. And the song won't stand on its own because it's, it's, it's a, the stepchild of this film. And Zemeckis was really smart that way. Uh, I mean, they all were because they could have clearly had a song that had something to do with the movie and had yeah. somebody write it. Uh, but they didn't. They chose Power Love. And of course, Power of Love was nominated for a Grammy and Oscar and the whole nine One, yards. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Zero. Not, not, Which I was so blank. frustrated. I no watched Oscar, the Oscars. No Grammy. Yeah. No, we we're nominated for like 10 Grammys. I know. One. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen just killed us. Man. Yeah. Nine for, uh, or something for Born in the USA. Of course, when Marty plays it on right. the guitar, the, right. him and the pinheads. Right. I love that as a kid. I was like, that's Huey Lewis. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it was you. My dad's like, I, I don't think so. Because I saw that movie once a week. Because oh, cool. it, it came out in our little... Well, then, little, then it worked. Because that was our idea. That all along, uh, Zemeckis and Gail, wanted Bobby, the two Bobs said, you know, you we got to get, get to be in this somehow. I said, no, no, no. That's silly. Don't worry about it. And so finally, they kept harping on me. I finally said, okay, look, it disguise me. If you do it uncredited, disguised, make it an inside joke thing, I'll do it. And the funny story there, he's, he was the head of the label at CBS, Jack Crago. Yeah, Jack Crago. Jack, yeah. He was a wonderful guy, man. Yeah. I don't know where he is today, but he, he was a great guy. He was a head of the label. But, but he's a real square guy. You know, he'd say, how's it going, Huey? He's talk really <laughs> slow and purposeful, you know. And so... When I went, he was a brown shoes guy, you know, kind of brown coats. And I show up on the set, and there's your wardrobe. They show me the, the wardrobe, and it was Jack Crago. <laughs> so I just adopted Jack Crago, and I did, did it as Jack Crago. Now, it's six months or three months later. I'm in his office in, in Chicago, <laughs> in New York. And I go up to the office, and he goes, Huey, I've just seen your, um, uh, your masterful performance in Back to the Future. I said, well, I think he's just... And I'm thinking, um, um, you should probably win an Oscar. Or, or maybe I should. <laughs> Man, when Back to the Future came out, it dominated every aspect of pop culture. I remember it played in our little movie theater in Blackfoot, Idaho for like three months straight. I saw it 18 times in the theater that summer. I'm not kidding. It's a film that still holds up. I just love it. Now, one thing that Huey told me as we were, you know, hanging out before the live event, 
hung out for a couple hours, and I just got to ask him things. The reason Marty McFly plays the song with the pinheads, but he never sings it, is because the song wasn't actually finished at that moment. Uh, he just showed him the part that was done, and that's what Marty plays. Also, this song, as we say we're up for a lot of Grammys, is up for Record of the Year and Song of the Year, and one of the most competitive years in Grammy history, you know, back when good music was actually nominated. The songs nominated for Record of the Year in 85 were as follows. The Boys of Summer by Don Henley. Money for Nothing by Dire Straits. Born in the USA by the Boss Bruce Springsteen. Power Love by Huey Lewis in the News. And the eventual winner, We Are the World by USA for Africa. Which Huey Lewis actually sang on. We actually have that story of We Are the World from Kenny and Huey and a bunch of other people that were there. Let me know if you want to see that one. One last thought here. It's interesting that Huey was hesitant to write a song for a movie because he didn't want to call it Back to the Future, you know, the title of the movie. So he sent over the next thing that he did, which was Power of Love, and of course it became this huge number one hit. But then Huey wrote Back in Time for the movie, which the title of that is not far from Back to the Future, Back in Time. <laughs> Well, back in time, it wasn't a hit because it wasn't ever released as a single. But I tell you what, it would have been a hit. All these years later, back in time, it's just as recognizable as the power of love. Go figure. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Huey Lewis and the power of love and this incredible movie, Back to the Future, and his cameo. Let's have a great discussion. I just love the energy of this song. I love the guitar. I love his vocal. It's still one of my favorite songs ever. My kids love it. They're, uh, it's just amazing. Let's have a great discussion below. What are your memories of it? What are your memories of 1985? One of the best years of music ever. Best years, period. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.